You're listening to the Cyberwire Network, powered by N2K. Australia warns of a large-scale ransomware data breach. The Justice Department charges five with helping North Korean IT workers evade sanctions. The FCC wants to beef up a BGP. Antidot is a new Android banking trojan. The SEC enhances disclosure obligations. Researchers uncover vulnerabilities in GE ultrasound devices. A Baltimore neo-Nazi pleads guilty to conspiring to take down an electrical grid. On our Solution Spotlight, N2K's Simone Petrella speaks with Alicia Cade, director in Google Cloud's office of the CISO, about the CISO role, board communication, and cyber workforce development. And tanks for the warm water, but you can keep the vulnerabilities. It's Friday, May 17th, 2024. I'm Dave Bittner, and I'm back with your CyberWire Intel Briefing. Thanks for joining us here today. Happy Friday. It is great to have you with us. The Australian government has issued a warning about a large-scale ransomware data breach impacting healthcare data disclosed by prescription company MetaSecure. The breach, affecting personal and health information, is believed to have originated from a third-party vendor. MetaSecure emphasized transparency and promised updates on its website. This incident recalls the October 2022 ransomware attack on MetaBank, which led to the publication of sensitive health care for 480,000 individuals on the dark web, prompting significant cybersecurity reforms in Australia. The National Cybersecurity Coordinator and the Federal Police are investigating the MetaSecure breach, with limited details currently available. Cybersecurity Minister Claire O'Neill confirmed she had been briefed and stressed the importance of avoiding speculation to support the ongoing response efforts. The U.S. Justice Department has charged a U.S. woman and a Ukrainian man, along with three unidentified foreign nationals, for helping North Korean IT workers secure remote jobs at U.S. companies using false identities. This scheme involved defrauding over 300 companies, including several Fortune 500 firms, by using U.S. payment platforms and proxies to disguise the workers' locations. The operation generated at least $6.8 million for North Korea from October 2020 through 2023. The U.S. State Department is offering up to $5 million for information disrupting the financial mechanisms supporting North Korea or identifying the three foreign nationals involved. The FBI has also issued a warning to help companies avoid hiring North Korean IT workers posing as freelancers. FCC Chairwoman Jessica rosen Warsel proposed requiring ISPs to submit confidential reports on securing the Border Gateway Protocol, BGP, a critical Internet routing system. The proposal aims to protect against national security threats by bad actors exploiting BGP vulnerabilities. The FCC's interest in BGP security heightened in 2022 due to threats from Russian hackers. BGP hijacks can lead to data theft, extortion, espionage, and disrupted transactions. The proposal includes implementing original validation and RPKI to ensure route legitimacy. Major ISPs would need to develop and report BGP security plans and submit public quarterly progress updates. The FCC will vote on this proposal in June. Experts say enhancing BGP security is crucial for national security, communication, and commerce. Threat intelligence firm Cybel has identified a new Android banking trojan, Antidot, which steals user credentials and conversations while also spying on them. Disguised as a Google Play update, Antidot uses overlay attacks to collect credentials. Its capabilities include remote control via VNC, key logging, screen recording, 
forwarding calls, collecting contacts and SMS messages, and performing USSD requests. The malware tricks users into granting permissions by displaying a fake Google Play update page in their language. Antidot then communicates with a command and control server to execute various tasks like unlocking devices, making calls, and initiating VNC to control the device. It uses WebView to show phishing pages and capture credentials through overlay attacks, targeting banking and cryptocurrency apps. Cybel highlights Antidot's advanced features and stealthy operations aimed at evading detection. The SEC has unanimously adopted new rules to enhance financial firms' obligations to warn investors about privacy breaches. Updating regulations from 2000, The amendments require broker-dealers, investment companies, registered advisors, and transfer agents to develop policies for detecting, responding to, and recovering from data breaches. Firms must now notify customers if their personal information has likely been exposed. SEC Chair Gary Gensler emphasized the need for these updates to protect investors' financial data. The rule changes take effect 60 days after publication, with larger firms having 18 months and smaller firms 24 months to comply. Researchers from Nozomi Networks discovered 11 security vulnerabilities in GE Healthcare's Vivid Ultrasound products and two related software programs, with severities ranging from 5.7 to 9.6 on the CVSS scale. Issues include missing encryption and hard-coded credentials, Some vulnerabilities could lead to remote code execution with full privileges, though the most severe cases require physical access, which reduces risk. However, physical access is feasible in hospitals and clinics. For instance, the Vivid T9 system's GUI could be bypassed to gain administrative privileges and execute arbitrary code, while the Echo Pack software could be compromised using hard-coded credentials. Patches and mitigations are available on GE Healthcare's product security portal. Sarah Beth Clendaniel, age 36, pleaded guilty to conspiring with neo-Nazi leader Brandon Russell to destroy electrical substations around Baltimore, aiming to cause massive destruction. Clendaniel, who planned the attack with Russell, called it a plot that would completely lay this city to waste. She admitted to charges of conspiracy to damage an energy facility and illegal firearm possession. The government will recommend a sentence of up to 18 years. The FBI described Russell's group, Adam Waffen Division, as a racially motivated extremist organization. Glenn Daniel, who has a terminal illness, sought to target five substations to create a cascading power failure. Authorities found firearms and ammunition at her home, despite her being prohibited from possessing them due to past felony convictions. Russell's trial is set for July 9th. Coming up after the break, our own Simone Petrella speaks with Alicia Cade director in Google Cloud's Office of the CISO, talking about the CISO role, board communication, and cyber workforce development. Stay with us. Every day, your IAM tech debt grows. Your multi-generational services struggle to work together. Building an identity fabric can fix this. It makes all your identity tooling stronger and allows you to connect any app to any service you want to use with zero coding, zero maintenance, and zero app downtime. Strata's identity orchestration platform separates the identity logic from your applications so you can optimize existing IAM tools and manage them in a single control plane. Now, every vendor, standard, and architecture work together. In short, building your identity fabric means you can secure your non-standard apps. 
keep your complex access policies, retire outdated IDPs, and modernize in record time. So build your fabric with Strata Identity and get rid of tech debt for good. Visit strata.io slash cyberwire, share your identity priorities, and receive a pair of AirPods Pro. Offer valid for organizations over 5,000 employees. Connect today at strata.io slash cyberwire. Simone Petrella is our N2K Cyberwire president, and at the recent RSA conference in San Francisco, she caught up with Alicia Cade, director in Google Cloud's office of the CISO. Here's their conversation. Thank you for joining, Alicia. It's so good to have you. Thank you for having me. How's the conference going for you so far? It's been busy, as always. I It's my fourth time. I've been here as a CISO, as a consultant, and now, of course as a a Google Cloud representation. Well, I feel like Google Cloud is everywhere, so literally and figuratively, so (laughs) well done. Um, Now, I know one of the things from your background, and you have been on the industry side, you've been on the vendor side, and I know one of the things that you have focused a lot on is how CISOs in today's world can really what are some of those challenges that they're facing? And what are, some, what are some of the things you're learning or you're kind of in the colleagues conversations that you're having with colleagues today? What's some of your advice to those CISOs? I think uh, definitely CISOs role is, has always been seen for quite some time, although it's a relatively new profession, right? Um, it has been seen as um, 24 by 7 has been seen, especially in regulated sectors, uh, and the regulatory focus, very much so. And has been seen as um, a distributed, let's say, an owner of a very distributed risk, because cyber risk is present throughout the business. It's people, technology, and processes, of course. And that risk is very often actually owned by the business divisions, by CIOs and CTOs, and yet the CISOs are accountable for it. So it's also a role where you have to have great relationships, robust relationships within the business, and the role, the success of which, really depends on uh, those relationships, but also, therefore, on the culture within the company. So lots of pressures from being technical expert, of course, and making sure that your technology, security technology, is robust and helps you and processes as well, and skilled um, skill team, and it helps you detect the risk, of course, and address the risk proactively. And on the other hand, relationship experts as well. So, yeah. um, and my advice to CISOs would be to make sure that you do focus on those relationships as well. You probably have very capable team. You probably have tools, and as we can see in RSA, there's plenty of (laughs) tools and shiny toys available. But think about the business. Think about building relationships with your board members as well, who will help you drive the right security culture. And um, think about before we buy all these tools, and maybe that's also for the CIOs and CTOs, that we think about the business strategy. How can they help us actually achieve the business strategy, our goals, and let's think about organization, and then perhaps technology. That's a theme that I've heard over the last few years, and I grew up in the cybersecurity industry myself, and with everyone that wanted to find a technical solution, and as the CISO role has gotten elevated, The last couple of years, we've finally started to focus on this notion that being a CISO is you have to be as connected to the context of the business that you're in as much as you are just protecting any any asset or any attack surface from cybersecurity threats. And that business context, I think, is something that is new to a lot of folks in these leadership roles who have maybe grown up in more of the technical tracks of cybersecurity. Absolutely. And... I think that context, the need for that context becomes very pronounced, I think, when the companies embark on digital transformation journey, because that's where it comes out. What are we trying to achieve here? And if we not focus on strategy, and if CISO doesn't also think about that strategy, perhaps the solutions, cybersecurity solutions implemented or 
even take it broader from the CIO perspective, technology solutions implemented won't be relevant. Right. right? It will be kind of lift and shift mode and uh, back to square one. And the other context when it come out, comes up is, of course, in a touch wood incident situation. To be really ready for the business to, to respond to cyber incidents, there is, uh, of course, capability of the cybersecurity teams uh, that's needed, but also the business has to be ready. Yeah. People need to know how to operate when the system is out because your cybersecurity will focus on that resolution, but the business um, uh, representatives and operations need to know how to how to operate without and for how long can we survive without right. so that connectivity is is very very necessary to the successful recovery. Yeah, and you mentioned earlier about, you know, you come in and it's really about people, process, and technology, but we're at this expo, we're at this conference that has so many shiny new tools and toys. I have always felt, tell me if you disagree, that we over-index on the technology a lot of times and we kind of neglect some of the process, but particularly the people. Is that something that you have found throughout your career or do you think we're doing an okay job? Um, I always said throughout my career that I'm a, um, a bit of a jam in the sandwich. <laughs> so there's the technology. I like that. I'm going to use that technology layer. Yeah, and jam comes from the UK, of course. Uh, there is the technology layer, and of course there's the business layer, and you do have to gel that. Um, yes, we are in this context in the RSA, right? It's a huge market of technology solutions, but I think what's uh, really uplifting, you also see solutions which help to understand the risk. You know, there is a goal somewhere in there uh, in making sure people have, the, the companies have better visibility of the surface. And it's also interesting because some of those solutions, of course, they focus on cybersecurity, but perhaps can be then taken the ideas and kind of applied to the broader operational risk perspective as well. So maybe there is there is also that trend. And I think as you know, the years have progressed since my kind of beginning of my CISO career, uh, there is a bigger interest from the boards and from the business as well on really understanding the cyber risk, especially with technological uh, progress, right? The cloud and also with, with AI as well. No longer people, the, the organization see it as a black box. They really want to understand what are the right questions to ask right. to understand the risk as well. Yeah, what recommendations or what advice would you give for CISOs who are now having to present and are finding themselves in front of the board more than they had in the past? And sometimes the board doesn't know what questions to ask yet. And so we kind of put ourselves in this disconnect where we want to show them we're doing great things, but we don't want their eyes to glaze over when they look at, you know, a stoplight chart full of all these metrics of controls that mean nothing to them. Like, what's the balance? So interesting you ask that because we've been uh, driving what we call the Board Insights um, initiative. Uh, we have a Board Insights hub where we publish uh, three times a year board perspective and we interview board members as well and CISOs to get their views on, on that board CISO interactions. And I would say that um, uh, there isn't this holy grail of the, the best ever CISO metrics uh, report that you can bring to the board. I think what is important is that the boards understand CISOs and the CISOs understand boards. And it's not about show and tell meeting, yeah. one of meeting. It's about building relationships with each other. So the biggest recommendation for, the, uh, for both parties would be really connect. Connect outside of the, of the meeting. Get to know each other. Get to know in an open way of the challenges from the CISO perspective and also what are the concerns of the board members because then the conversation in the board meeting will be completely different. It won't be about that PowerPoint slide and those numbers. It will start from a different foot of the understanding. Yeah. It all comes down to human relationships. We can have so many tools or so many metrics. Absolutely. But yeah, you got to yes. build that relationship Absolutely. with the, the business. Well, Alicia, thank you so much for joining us today. I hope you enjoy the rest of the week. And I guess if there are any other questions, is there anything else that you wanted to chat about, either what you're doing with Google Cloud, some initiatives you're excited about, anything on that front? Uh, definitely our uh, 
part of my job, of course, it's financial services and the yeah. engagement with the financial services CISOs. But uh, more broadly, I also drive the CISO uh, advocacy for, for Google Cloud. So we engage with all CISOs, whether they are our customers or not. And we're building the community because I also think that in this tough job climate, um, it's so important that there is the information sharing with, between the CISOs. There is that platform where peers to peers can share experience. And whether this is through the community, let's say, events and, and connecting points, but also through collaboration, through sector, um, sector organizations. So we really appreciate and deeply engage the IS with ISACs. And uh, for example, we were one of the first critical service providers to, to join financial security ISAC. So really proud of the fact that now as an ex-CISO, I can be connecting with CISOs and making sure that we all lift the, the burden and the cyber risk profile right. of the sectors. Yeah, incredible. Well, thank you so much for sharing. Appreciate your time uh, and enjoy the rest of your week. Thank you so much. Great right. to meet you. Thank you. That's N2K CyberWire's Simone Petrella speaking with Alicia Cade from Google Cloud. Are lengthy security reviews pulling attention away from your security program? With the largest network of trust centers, Vanta can help you streamline security reviews to win customer trust, save time, and close deals fast. Proactively demonstrate security by showcasing key resources like your SOC 2 or ISO 27001 and provide real-time evidence for passing controls. And when a security questionnaire is required, Vanta takes the first pass for you. Visit vanta.com slash cyber to take a self-serve tour. That's vanta.com slash cyber. And finally, our home automation desk shares a story about a homeowner's quest for hot water that took an unexpected turn. When Ars Technica senior technology reporter Kevin Purdy and his wife moved into a new house, they found a Renai tankless water heater installed. These heaters are energy efficient, but take their sweet time to deliver hot water. One day, while trying to solve the issue of slow hot water, he discovered a Wi-Fi module magnetically stuck to the back of the heater. Installing the module, he found he could control the heater with an app, triggering the recirculation feature to get hot water faster. This seemed like a win, but the app was clunky and required him to pull out his phone every time he wanted hot water. Being a home automation enthusiast, he dug deeper and found an unofficial Renai component that allowed for more advanced control. He could now set the heater to recirculate on a schedule triggered by various conditions. Everything was working great until he discovered a serious security flaw in the system. Turns out, with just an email address, anyone could control the water heater. This meant a bad actor could potentially make the water scalding hot or continuously recirculate, wasting energy and water. He collaborated with other tech enthusiasts to verify the issue and prepared a security advisory for Renai. Despite the serious nature of the flaw, the company was slow to respond, Eventually, Renai updated their authentication system and released a new app, but the experience left Kevin Purdy wary of relying too heavily on smart devices. Throughout this process, he realized the challenges of DIY tech solutions. Companies might issue DMCA notices or legal threats against those who create unofficial integrations, even if they improve functionality. He also found a supportive community of like-minded individuals who shared his passion for smarter, more efficient home automation. In the end, he successfully automated his water heater using open-source tools and a bit of ingenuity. Now he enjoys hot water on demand without the hassle of waiting. It was a winding journey filled with surprises, but it ended with a warm and satisfying result.
And that's the CyberWire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. After reporting on the international law enforcement takedown of Breach Forum yesterday, we have a special edition podcast this weekend about the 10th anniversary of the first indictment against the PLA. It features my conversation with Dave Picton, the former U.S. attorney who signed that indictment. Watch for it on your CyberWire Daily podcast feed this Sunday. Be sure to check out this weekend's Research Saturday and my conversation with Hossein Yavarzadeh from the University of California, San Diego. We're discussing his work on Pathfinder, high-resolution control flow attacks exploiting the conditional branch predictor. That's Research Saturday. Check it out. We'd love to know what you think of this podcast. Your feedback ensures we deliver the insights that keep you a step ahead in the rapidly changing world of cybersecurity. If you like our show, please share a rating and review in your podcast app. Please also fill out the survey in the show notes or send an email to cyberwire at n2k.com. We're privileged that N2K Cyberwire is part of the daily routine of the most influential leaders and operators in the public and private sector, from the Fortune 500 to many of the world's preeminent intelligence and law enforcement agencies. N2K makes it easy for companies to optimize your biggest investment, your people. We make you smarter about your teams while making your teams smarter. Learn how at n2k.com. This episode was produced by Liz Stokes. Our mixer is Trey Hester, with original music and sound design by Elliot Peltzman. Our executive producer is Jennifer Iben. Our executive editor is Brandon Karp. Simone Petrella is our president. Peter Kilpie is our publisher. And I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here next week. Hi, everybody. It's Maria Varmazas here, your host over at T-Minus Space Daily, and sometimes a guest on Hacking Humans, too. We here at N2K CyberWire work hard to bring you concise, intelligence-driven news and commentary, and we'd like to know how we're doing. Please take a few minutes to complete our audience survey and share your feedback to help us continue to grow and meet your needs. Visit cyberwire.com slash survey. That's cyberwire.com slash survey to get started. Thanks so much for your input as we reach for the stars. It means the universe to us. And now a word from our sponsor, Zscaler, the leader in cloud security. Cyber attackers are using AI in creative ways to compromise users and breach organizations. In a security landscape where you must fight AI with AI, the best AI protection comes from having the best data. Zscaler has extended its zero-trust architecture with powerful AI engines that are trained and tuned by 500 trillion daily signals. Learn more about Zscaler Zero Trust plus AI to prevent ransomware and AI attacks. Experience your world secured. Visit zscaler.com slash zero trust AI.